Hello, and welcome to class 16 of Physics 350 on the magnetic vector potential. Um, this covers section 5.4 of the textbook. And uh, magnetic vector potential is the magnetic analog to the electric potential. But as the name suggests, instead of being a regular number, a scalar, it's going to be a, uh, a vector. And um, there's a reason why it has to be a vector, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, the magnetic vector potential is, uh, because it's a vector, it's not as easy to work with um, as the electric potential, which is very convenient being a scalar. Um, <clears throat> and so there aren't as many, uh, it's not used as widely, like we don't have magnetic vector potential meters like we have voltmeters. Um, but um, it's very, it turns out to be very important when we extend uh, electricity and magnetism to relativity and to quantum um, mechanics. So it's important to know that it exists and how it relates to the magnetic field. Okay, so the definition of the magnetic vector potential. Let's first go over the, review the definition of the electric potential. Um, v, uh, <clears throat> because the curl of E is equal to zero, um, that allowed us to define E as minus the gradient of a scalar potential. And the reason for that is from uh, um, vector calculus, the curl of a gradient is of any function is always zero. So if we take the curl of the gradient of any function v, we get zero. So that is consistent with the curl of e being uh, zero. So that's what a this is what allows us to define the um, uh, define a scalar potential for the electrical case. Um, for the magnetic case, we know that the, uh, I don't have a, the equation here, but we established last time that the curl of, of B is not zero, it's equal to mu naught J, which is Ampere's line integral law. So if we tried to define a scalar potential um, for the scalar magnetic potential, we would run into the same problem that the curl of the gradient of that would be um, zero and not mu naught j. So that's the reason why we can't use a scalar potential for the magnetic field. So what can we use? Um, we can use a vector potential. So our main equation for the, uh, uh, that we, one of the main equations we derived last time is that the divergence of B is equal to zero. And uh, that inter actually allows us to define the magnetic field as the curl of a vector potential, as opposed to the gradient of a scalar potential. Why is that the case? Well, another um, property coming from vector calculus is that the divergence of the curl of any vector field is zero. So notice if we take the divergence of the curl of A here, no matter what A is, we get zero. And so that's consistent with our, our um, physical uh, property that the, the divergence of B is always zero. Okay, so, um, so that's, that's what, how A is defined. It's defined so that taking the curl of it gives our magnetic field. Um, <clears throat> so what are some properties of it? Well, we can start with uh, Ampere's law, which I, I just mentioned up here. Del cross B is mu naught J. Um, del cross B, if we substitute in uh, uh, the curl of A, so the curl of the curl of A, then we use a vector identity, um, which I'm not going to prove here. Um, it's, they're listed in our textbook, I'm not gonna prove that. It turns out that the curl, the curl of a vector is the 
gradient of the divergence of the vector minus the Laplacian of the vector. And that's supposed to be equal to mu naught j. Okay, so um, in principle, uh, if we, this given j, given our current densities, we could use this to find an a that satisfies that. But a is appearing in two different places here, and that would be a extremely difficult um, equation to solve. Um, it turns out that we can always choose, it turns out we can always choose our vector potential a so that the divergence of a is zero, so, so that this term goes away, and we're left just with this term, which leaves a, a simpler equation. So we can always can choose that the divergence of a is equal to zero. So let's just see briefly why that's true. Um, suppose that we picked a original vector potential a naught, which did have a divergence. Okay, so it it uh, taking the curl of a of a naught gave b, but the divergence of a naught was not zero. Then we can add. Uh, it turns out we can add the gradient of a scalar function to a naught in such a way to to eliminate the divergence. Okay, and let's see why that's the case. Um, so if uh, a is equal to a naught plus the gradient of lambda, then the divergence of a is the divergence of a naught plus the divergence of the gradient of lambda. The divergence of the gradient is also known as the Laplacian here, okay? So in order for the divergence of a to be zero, we would want this side to be zero. So we want the Laplacian of this function lambda, which we're looking for, to be minus uh, the divergence of uh, a naught, okay? So how do we know whether that, can we find this function lambda? Well, here we can use a trick or, uh, or recognize something, and that is that this is similar to um, Poisson's equation for the electric potential. Okay, um, I'll just remind you, Poisson's equation for the electric potential was that the Laplacian of V was minus rho over epsilon naught. Okay, it came from Gauss's law that the, um, the divergence of E is rho over epsilon naught, so the, the um, divergence of the gradient of V is minus rho over epsilon naught. But notice the similarity between this equation and this equation. Um, we have the uh, a, a scalar, because the divergence of a naught is some arbitrary scalar. This rho over epsilon naught is some arbitrary charge density. And then on the other side, we have the Laplacian of an unknown function. And this is the Laplacian of an unknown function. We know we can always find a voltage or an electric potential that satisfies this physically. So it turns out we can always find uh, a, this function lambda, which is a function of scalar function of space, which satisfies this. So therefore, we can always um, find a lambda to, such that when we add the gradient to A naught, we get A, and A has zero divergence. OK? So, um, Maybe that was a bit technical, but um, just to summarize, we can always choose the vector potential so that it has zero divergence. And when we choose it to have zero divergence, this kind of messy term goes away and we're left with this equation here, okay? <clears throat> so this is our def uh, defining equation for the vector potential. Um, it's a differential equation. Um, we'd still like to know how to um, calculate the vector potential um, constructively as opposed to having a differential equation. Um, to do that, we can uh, to do that, we can notice again the similarity of this equation. Del, del squared a is equal to minus mu naught j. 2 del squared v is equal to minus rho over epsilon naught. 
um, this is this equation has three components ax ay az and jx jy jz but if we look at um, the x component uh, ax del squared ax is equal to minus mu naught jx that's of the, exactly the same form as del squared v is minus rho over epsilon naught and likewise for a y and j y and a z and j z um, j z no no relation to the wrapper by the way sorry just had to get that in there um, anyway uh, so um, we know how to solve for the vector potential sorry the um, electric potential in terms of the charge density it's equal to um, sorry didn't mean to put that up it's equal to the a one over four pi epsilon naught times the integral of rho dv or d, d tau as it in, a, in our textbook over r. So this equation must be have the same form of solution. So a of r must be instead of one over four pi epsilon naught, it's for magnetic systems mu naught over four pi times the integral of j instead of rho um, d tau over separation r. Okay, so just by looking at the how these two differential equations are structured the same, we can say that we know how uh, the solution to this equation um, in integral form, so the solution to this equation in the integral form must look the same, except that it's a vector. And then, uh, for line currents, J d tau, the current density times the volume, becomes the current times the length. Okay. Um, as we talked about with the biot savart law, because this is uh, current per area, this is volume, and this is current, and this is length. So they're both, they both have units of current times length. So, um, okay, so, oops, I meant to summarize. Um, so we have an explicit way to calculate the electric potential from a set of either line currents or um, uh, uh, vector distributed currents, J. Um, we have a differential equation, which defines A, the relationship between A and the uh, current density. And we know once we have A um, coming from either of those two methods, um, we can get the relationship is that the curl of A gives us the magnetic field. Okay. Okay, let's do an example. Um, that's a lot of theory. So we're going to find the vector potential of an, uh, an solenoid, a very long or infinite solenoid with n turns per unit length radius r and current i. And you may remember from 202 that a solenoid is basically a uh, helix with very closely wrapped loops like this. And um, there are, uh, the parameters are the number of turns per unit length. Okay, so the number of turns divided by the length. And since it's infinite, we don't have a well-defined length, so we go. We define turns per unit length, the radius r and the current i. All right. So how do we calculate the vector potential? Well, um, it's similar to uh, we use in the Amperian loop uh, an imaginary loop um, with uh, a loop that is contained inside the solenoid and one that is contained or is goes outside the solenoid. Um, and the line integral of the vector potential over one of those uh, Amperian loops <clears throat> uh, is equal to the uh, surface integral of the curl of A, okay? Uh, and that's because of Stokes' theorem, right? So this isn't true just for A, this is true for any vector field. 
that the, the line integral around a closed loop is equal to the surface integral of the curl of that vector field. So we're using Stokes theorem here. And then what is the curl of A? Okay, um, we talked about it on the last slide, but I'll give you a second to just try to remember. The curl of A is the magnetic field. Um, that's how we defined it. It's the, the vector potential, the curl of the vector potential is the magnetic field. So this is integral of B dot DA, which we recognize as the flux through the loop. So the line integral of the um, vector potential is just equal to the flux through the uh, imaginary loop that we're using to um, calculate the, the uh, vector potential. Um, okay, so can we get the flux through one of the loops? We can using Ampere's law, um, which we learned last time, Ampere's line integral law in integral form. Um, we can analyze uh, this situation. Uh, I'm not gonna add that calculation on top of the calculation of the vector potential, but it turns out that the result of this is that B is equal to mu naught times N times the current I. Okay, mu naught N I inside of the solenoid. Uh, outside the solenoid, it turns out if it's an truly an infinite solenoid, the magnetic field goes to zero. All right, so uh, the line integral of uh, A is going to be just A times two pi S, whoa, hold on there. Um, A times two pi S, the circumference of our Amperian loop, that's supposed to be equal to the flux which is the magnetic field, mu naught ni, as I said, times the area of the Ampyrean loop, pi s squared. So now we, we have the ingredients necessary to calculate A. We just divide uh, this, we divide by two pi s, and we get A is equal to, uh, so the pi is cancel, the two comes down. We get A is equal to mu naught ni s over two. And it's in the uh, phi hat direction, the direction around the loop, but as the loop goes around the, I guess you'd call that the azimuthal direction. Um, that's for inside the solenoid. For outside the solenoid, um, similar, the, the uh, circulation or the uh, line integral of A is still A times two pi S for a loop which contains, which is outside the cylinder. But remember that I, I mentioned that the magnetic field here is zero outside the solenoid. So the only magnetic field is magnetic field inside the solenoid. So we wanna multiply the magnetic field not by pi S squared, but by pi R squared, where R is the radius of the solenoid, because there's only magnetic field inside the solenoid. So we get A times two pi S is equal to this expression. Again, dividing by two pi S, pi's cancel, we get a two in the denominator, but now we have R squared over S. Uh, and that's the formula that should hold for S outside of the uh, solenoid. So these should match at the um, these should match at the boundary, right? They should match at the boundary. Um, so for s equal to r, this just becomes mu naught on i r over two, and for s equal to r at the edge, this becomes mu naught n i r squared over r, which is r. So mu naught n i r over two. So they match at the boundary. So that gives us confidence that our solutions are reasonable since they should limit to the same value where they overlap at the edge of the solenoid. Okay, and then taking the curl of A should recover the magnetic field, um, which as, as I mentioned is non-zero inside equal to mu naught ni and zero outside. So we'll try 
uh, taking the curl of these functions in class, verifying that, and doing some <clears throat> at least one or two other exercises on the vector potential. Okay, great. Thanks for your attention and see you in class.